All right, we are back, and thank you for joining me again. I had a really nice time at the beach last week, and so why wait till Sunday is back in full in full swing. We've got about six weeks until kickoff, and we are continuing our off season program here. And what I want to do today is talk about the Heisman. That's like the most prestigious award, of course, in college football, and. You know, it has implications for a lot of the things that we're all concerned about, whether you're betting the odds of the Heisman itself uh, has implications for who's going to score the most points, um, you know, for the college side of your C2C leagues. It also has implications for draft capital, potentially. Uh, most of these guys that win the Heisman, whether you're a quarterback or not, get first round draft capital. So it's almost a lock for that, even if they come out of nowhere like Joe Burrow or um, you know, even if you don't think the guy's that good of a quarterback like Tim Tebow, he won the Heisman and got selected in the first round. Lamar Jackson won the Heisman, got selected in the first round. You know, these are uh, really, really premium players. Um, and winning that award does do something for draft capital. They're probably good anyway, but winning that seems to put that cherry on the top of getting extremely high draft capital. And in a lot of cases for quarterbacks, it's the number one overall draft pick. Um, <clears throat> uh, but yeah, we're going to do the intro first, and then we're going to get into the Heisman odds and potential for the players of this season. Hello, and welcome to Why Wait Till Sunday. I'm your host, Alfred, and I am here with a very special guest tonight. This guy's got it all, everything you could ask for. Longhorn fans are excited about Bijan Robinson, number five. This is a guy that comes in as the number one running back recruit in the country. Elite, elite, elite. Back to the ground with Robinson who spins and then tries to bounce it. A stiff arm, another one as he rides it, keeps his balance. They're going to say he stepped down. He's got tremendous upside. Stevenson, a little bit of pressure as he launches it downfield. Touchdown Sooners, the breakout freshman, Marvin Mims. Oh, this is so confused on defense. Lane Kiffin was trying to get a timeout. Instead, it's a first down, and it's a touchdown for defense. He's my play of the week. Smash potential here. That's what I'm saying. The royalty of college football is in assembly at the Rose Bowl 2006. Thank you for joining us. Let's talk some Heisman. I wanted to let you know, I went back and looked actually since the, you know, uh, BCS era back in 1998. And I was curious, as, as I mentioned in the intro that, you know, how much first round draft capital do these guys have? And if you're a quarterback, you have to go all the way back to 2000. Well, if you're any position, to be honest with you, all the way back to 2006, um, where Troy Smith won the Heisman, but then was selected, I think in the fifth round of the NFL draft. And I think it was pretty well known. He was, you know, not necessarily an NFL caliber quarterback. And, um, you know, he was much more of a runner and he played in kind of that scheme at Ohio state. But in any case, he did win the Heisman and did not get first round draft capital. Um, other than that, you have to go to Jason white in 2003, who actually went undrafted, never really played for an NFL team. Although I think there were some injury issues there with his knees and other things like that. After he won the Heisman, Eric crouch in 2001, but he was a known, you know, wasn't going to be an NFL quarterback as an option guy in, in college. And then Chris Winkie, who again was one of those old former baseball players who, uh, came back to school, won a Heisman, but, uh, got drafted late in the NFL draft. Other than that, everybody, I believe, was a first-round pick, quarterback or not, most of them being number one overall. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, winning the Heisman, as you could expect, is a, a, a lock to be um, that high of a draft pick. So let's talk first about these players and what does it look like 
you know, for Heisman winners. And I went back to 1998. This was the start of the BCS era. I think before that, it gets a little trickier because you didn't even have consensus uh, national champions. You didn't have national champions playing in a singular game. Uh, it was all voted on and all that kind of stuff, which was a bit of a mess. So what I wanted to do was look at, uh, since 1998, we have at least had a, a agreed upon championship game. Um, and then of course in the playoff, we've had four playoff contenders and then, uh, you know, they, they play it out, um, to the champion and I wanted to see how frequently do these quarterbacks or other players, you know, a- arrive on one of these championship contender teams, among other things. So let's just go through kind of the profile of a Heisman winner since 1998. A quarterback has won the Heisman 17 of 23 times in that span, which is 73%. There have been five running backs and one receiver. Five, two of those running backs were in 1998 and 1999, Ricky Williams and Ron Dane. So really since 2000, there's only been three out of 20 running backs. And then one wide receiver, of course, last year was Devontae Smith. Since the playoff era in particular in 2014, it's been five out of seven quarterbacks, 71%. So about the same ratio with one running back, Najee Harris, and one receiver, obviously, Devontae Smith. Both of those, of course, were from Alabama. Both of those were basically the number one team in the country competing for the national title. In the BCS era specifically, uh, or I'm sorry, more recently in the playoff era, like I said, we've seen one running back out of the seven. That was Najee Harris. In the BCS era, 10 out of 16 winners were in the championship game, uh, that BCS kind of agreed upon championship game, 10 10 out of 16, which honestly was not as high as I kind of thought it might be. It is over 50%, but it's not overwhelming. Obviously, a pretty decent amount of players that won were not in the championship game. But fast forward to the playoff era, 6 out of 7 winners were in the playoff, at least in those 4 spots. Uh, The only one who wasn't was Lamar Jackson. Um, at Louisville, whose numbers were just too gaudy to ignore. A true freshman has never won. Um, four second-year players, or 17% out of the 23 sample size. Five third-year players, seven fourth-year players, and five fifth-year players. So while us in the fantasy circles really like to see early production and early entry into the NFL draft, the Heisman voters don't seem to care as much as fourth and fifth-year players comprise over 50% of the winners uh, in this sample size. And that is, um, pre- you know, not surprising because this is not a who's going to be the best NFL player. This is who is the best player for that year in college football. Overall, five out of 23 quarterbacks were first year starters. Now this is an interesting point, especially for this year when three of the top four teams in the country based on odds to win the national title are breaking in brand new quarterbacks. So five out of the 23 quarterbacks were first year starters. Uh, that's about 22%. And that is, you know, not shocking to me. Um, I, th- I thought it might be a little lower than that, but when you look through five out of the 23 and that is not as low as I would have thought, I, I wouldn't rule out a first year starter based on knowing that information, although the odds are a little bit less, you know, less than, than you'd like to see. And then, uh, BCS era specifically was four out of 16 And um, only one out of the seven in the playoff era has one as a first year starter, um, which is that's kind of interesting. But the sample size is so small that, you know, I'm not sure that really matters. But four out of 16 in the BCS era and one out of seven in the playoff area. So when you combine all this stuff, you're ideally looking for a QB on a non playoff team who is not a freshman nor a first time starter. But before we get into the actual player names, let's now take a look at odds to win the national title. I looked at these, I think it was about a couple weeks ago. Um, so they may have changed slightly, but I don't think very much. The surprise of all of this is that Bama is the best uh, odds to win the Heisman at plus 250 or two and a half to one. Getting two and a half of your bet back if, if they should win it. Uh, Clemson is 
plus 350 or three and a half to one. Ohio State is plus 500, five to one. Oklahoma plus 700 or seven to one. Um, and those are the top four, you know, based on the odds that Vegas has set forth to win the national, you know, make the playoff presumably and win the national title. Just slightly outside of the top four is Georgia, who is uh, plus 800 or 8 to 1 to win the national title. So Oklahoma is 7 to 1. Georgia is only 8 to 1. Then you have a really big gap. Uh, You know, those five teams are very clearly the favorites. And then you have a a trio of teams that are, um, you know, there's a big gap. But the next three are kind of in the same boat. You've got Texas A&M at 25 to 1. So Georgia is 8 to 1. The next closest team is Texas A&M at 25 to 1. Pretty big jump. So, you know, Vegas basically thinks five teams have a real chance at winning this thing. Wisconsin's at 35 to 1. LSU is at 35 to 1. Then you have another uh, smaller gap. Um, but you go to UF, Notre Dame, Miami, Penn State, Iowa State, all at 40 to 1. And then a group at 50 to 1, which is Oregon, UNC, USC, Southern Cal, uh, Texas, Michigan, and Tennessee. And that really rounds out, you know, probably 15 or so teams. I didn't count them all. But, you know, after that, you start getting into even bigger dark horses. I think that covers most of the relevant teams that we would be worried about here. So when you look at that, we're going to say, who's the who's the QB on the four playoff teams? Well, out of the four playoff teams, there's only one QB who is not a first-time starter. That's Spencer Rattler for Oklahoma. Uh, this is pretty much the most obvious choice to have the best odds at winning the Heisman. He checks every single box. Um, Oklahoma is actually tied for the most Heismans in, in college football history with seven winners, I believe. Uh, they went back-to-back. Oklahoma QBs in 2017 and 2018 with Baker and then or Baker Mayfield and then Kyler Murray. Then they had a second place in 2019 with Jalen Hurts. So a Lincoln Riley quarterback has won or been second in three of the last four years. Um, Rattler is the starter on the team with the fourth best odds to win. Um at seven to one. So he's not the starter. He's not the QB starter on the, the, you know, the slam dunk team to win the high, to win the national title, but certainly a team that will, I think almost for sure make the playoff. And that's more what I'm concerned about than winning the actual national title. I just want a guy who's going to make the playoffs because the actual national title happens after the Heisman is given out. So it's really, you know, get into the playoff. You're a contender. And I think that's what really matters. Like I said, he is the only player who checks all the boxes, so it would make sense he is the favorite at five uh, plus five fifty or about five and a half to one uh, on your bet. Then you have a, the rest of the quarterbacks who are in these top teams to win to make the playoff round out your top four Heisman odds. That's DJ uh, Uingalele. Bryce Young and CJ Stroud in that order. DJU is plus 600 or 6 to 1. Bryce Young is plus 800 or 8 to 1. And CJ Stroud plus 10 or plus 1000 or 10 to 1. They check all the boxes in terms of um, being a QB on a very, very likely playoff team um, who is not a freshman. These are all going to be second year players, but they are first year starters. That's the only thing. Uh, you know, kind of that they don't fulfill in terms of the criteria for the most likely winner. Um, But like I said, especially given this climate, this season where you've got so many guys who are, are break so many teams who are, uh, you know, entering the season with a brand new starter. I think you can be a little more lenient there. Obviously the odds makers have been lenient there. And DJU is just barely behind Rattler. Um, And I agree with that. I would say he, you know, that's not a terrible bet to make six to one uh, just behind Spencer Rattler uh, for a team who's got much better odds to make the playoff and or win the national championship. So uh, if you're looking at a team who's got a better chance to be in that driver's seat to win the national title, Clemson and Bama are much better odds than Oklahoma. And you get, but you get, uh, more profitable odds on the Heisman, even though that those teams to win the national title are much, you know, much more likely to win the national title per the odds than Oklahoma. 
And then you got CJ Stroud, who's an interesting one. I think out of this group of four quarterbacks, he's the least kind of uh, <clears throat> well thought after in terms of, you know, you've got DJU and Bryce Young already people saying, you know, locks to be first round picks. Rattler is already probably the a lock to be the first quarterback taken in the 2022 NFL draft. And then you have CJ Stroud, who really has not been talked about that much as a first round pick. In fact, some people think he may end up transferring because uh, some people think he might not even start the whole year this year with um, the Kyle McCord coming in for Ohio State. And then you've got like the perfect prospect in Quinn Ewers coming to Ohio State in 2022. So there's a lot of cloudiness around CJ Stroud and his future, which is pretty interesting as the fourth, he's the fourth highest odds to win the Heisman Trophy. And people, I feel like in general, even some Ohio State fans are not like sold on CJ Stroud as the starter, even this year. So that is an odd one. <clears throat> I have a feeling there's a pretty good chance that Vegas just said, Ohio State, they'll be in the playoff. Who's their starting quarterback? Check, check, check. We have to put C.J. Stroud in as the fourth highest odds. It's just history uh, tells us that's got to be the case. And he's going to have um, a smorgasbord of weapons to throw to in Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave, et cetera, et cetera, uh, JS, uh, JSN. So it makes sense, but... Um, most people close to the program or who have watched the quarterbacks are not even sold that he's going to be the starter, you know, in 2022. So it'd be kind of weird for him to win the Heisman and then not even start the next season. Then we've got my first pick for like a sneaky value play is JT Daniels at 12 to one. He comes in as the fifth um, most likely guy to win. And also on the team that is fifth most likely to win the national title. This is something that is very much, I think, what the odds makers are essentially doing. Um, they're saying, who's going to win the national title? Who's their quarterback? That's the order we're going to put these guys in. Um, it's technically his first year beginning the season as a starter, but he was a QB down the stretch. So he he kind of checks all the boxes. If you're not going to say he's a first year starter because he started the bowl game, he started the second half of the season and he performed pretty well. In fact, his passing numbers are pretty comparable to Rattler last year in terms of completion percentage and, you know, yards per attempt, which is a great indicator for quality of the QB play. I think he's a really nice value. I mean, he's the fifth most likely to win based on odds. He's 12 to one. That's a pretty nice return. And you've got a guy on an SEC team who can make the playoff. I mean, pretty much a lock to win the East. That means they will be in the SEC title game. And the West of the SEC is a little bit shaky. I mean, Bama's obviously the favorite, but if you talk to uh, Richard Johnson over at Split Zone Duro, he thinks that Bama might lose four games um, this season. And so then who comes out of the West? I mean, Georgia probably beats, probably would be the favorite to beat anyone except for Bama out of the West. So if you put it in that perspective, JT Daniels is the quarterback on the SEC team, probably most likely to make the playoff other than Bama. And of course, the odds reflect that as well. But 12 to 1 is a pretty nice number. Um, and I think that's a little bit sneaky. And I think there's a very logical path to that paying out for you um, in terms of a Heisman bet. He looked really good. Now, I don't know about his pro prospects. I know that some people that watch him think he's a little wonky in his motions. Uh, I think I've heard, you know, that his his lower half is not consistent. He, I think he throws off his back foot. I mean, there's some issues there. But he's going to have a bevy of weapons at Georgia. They're going to be able to run the ball a ton and put teams away. But he towards the end of the season, you know, was throwing the ball all over the yard. He looked really explosive. He really unlocked that offense. And their, you know, their OC, Todd Monken, is known for throwing the ball all over the place, deep shots. I mean, there's going to be yards and stats to be had in this offense with JT Daniels and his arm opening up all, um, every blade of grass on the field. Instead of whoever else they were rolling out last year before uh, Daniels' knee kind of got better. So I I think just looking at, can you tell yourself a story 
where George is in the playoff, absolutely I can. Who's their quarterback, JT Daniels? And if you look at last year, he was putting up impressive statistics. And so that's also going to be something that is required. Uh, I think it's all there. Uh, I, I would take him over CJ Stroud. I might like him more than Bryce Young. Um, just straight up. And you're getting better numbers um, at plus 1,200. And then, of course, DJU and Spencer Rattler, though, are make more sense. I mean, th- those I would say those are appropriately the top two guys. But we're looking for value here. And, you know, basically, unless you're just going to bet the, 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 the leader in these categories, you are hoping for chaos. And so once you accept that as a, as a better, you know, you need to say, what is the path? What, can you sell me on a path? The next five, basically in a row, are Sam Howell, Matt Corral, uh, Derek King, Bijan Robinson, and Keaton Slovis. Uh, all varying between you know seventeen to one and twenty to one odds. Uh, Slovis comes in at twenty five to one. These are bets that I don't think the return is is really high enough to make a lot of sense because I think these teams have nearly zero chance to make the playoff. You know, UNC, I don't think they uh, unseat Clemson in the ACC. So you're telling me they'd have to like basically not win the conference and still somehow make the playoff. I don't see that happening out of, at least out of the ACC. I mean, the only team the only conferences that even you could dream of that scenario is the SEC and maybe the big 10, uh, maybe, but I don't think the ACC could put two teams in there. Um, and I don't see them beating Clemson for the ACC title. Matt Corral, again, SEC coming out of the West. They're going to have to take care of Texas A&M and Alabama. Uh, at least I don't know their East opponents this year off the top of my head, but I can't see Ole Miss. I mean, their defense still stinks. I, I do not see them winning. Uh, the West, much less winning the SEC championship and going to the playoff. Derek King, Miami, I think they have less of a chance to unseat Clemson as Sam Howell. Uh, B. John Robinson to Texas, I don't think they have any chance to winning the Big 12 uh, and or going undefeated. Uh, B. John Robinson would have to run for like, I mean, 20, definitely over 2,000 yards. And even then, I'm not sure if Texas isn't in the playoff. Um, And I don't think they will be. Uh, and then Keaton Slovis for Southern Cal. I think they that's that team's not very good. I don't really like the coaching staff there. I don't think they have a real shot at making the playoff. I mean, Pac-12 is fairly wide open. I I wouldn't bet on them to win the Pac-12. Um, and you know, if you're not winning the Pac-12, you're not going to be in the playoff. But you know, they'd have to be undefeated and make the playoff. I just don't see that for USC. Um, I don't think that's a, a great bet. Then you get down to where the odds are high enough. We're a little interested, and I promise this is not being a homer, but Emory Jones at 33 to 1. Again, the odds are high enough to where it's like maybe this is worth a poke. Uh, he went here, you know, he's at Florida. I think Florida has is an incredibly unlikely playoff team. Um, you know, they would have to beat Georgia. Uh, They have Bama on the schedule out of the West. So Florida has got to beat Bama. It is at home, but I don't, that feels so unlikely. They'd have to beat Bama and Georgia. um, Or I guess they, they could lose to Bama. They'd have to beat Georgia to win the East, go to the SEC championship, beat whoever that team is um, out of the West. And I think they could make the playoff. It probably comes down to beating Georgia. If they win the rest of their earth, uh, if they lose to Bama, it comes down to beating Georgia. And frankly, if they beat Bama, it still may come down to beating Georgia. So, uh, you know, there's one or two big games. The rest of the East isn't very good. Uh, their other West team, I think, is Mississippi State uh, and or LSU. Well, definitely LSU. Sorry. I know this is great podcasting. Um, I, you know, but coming out of the SEC, crazy things happen. You could make the playoff with a, as a one-loss team, uh, whereas I don't think you can make the playoff as a one-loss team out of the Pac-12 or Big 12, but you could definitely do it in the SEC. Um, they're going to have enough opportunity to impress. I mean, against Alabama, against LSU, against Georgia, there's going to be marquee, big-time, prime-time games where, uh, you know, that 
is exposure. That's uh, popularity, familiarity with who Emory Jones is. And then, of course, the cherry on top is he's a dual threat. And when you're talking about a dual threat quarterback who could run in 10 touchdowns or something, you know, say if they just go completely off, you're looking at massive TD potential and that's going to matter. So, uh, you know, you can run it in 10 to 15 times, throw for 25 to 30. Of, that's what it's going to take. But that's the type of quarterback that could do it is a dual threat quarterback. So you throw all those in there. 33 to one is, you know, I'm willing to entertain it. I don't think. I would put that bet down, but I wanted to bring it up because, again, if chaos happens, you can see a path for the Florida Gators quarterback to uh, pop off. And we know Dan Mullen's a good X's nose. My problems with Dan Mullen are more about recruiting, but he's going to have a good game plan come every Saturday, and he has historically gotten the most out of his quarterbacks. So I think that's not a terrible bet. Brees Hall is not a quarterback. So this is the first non-quarterback. Well, no, B. John Robinson was is the is the lowest or the highest odds for being a non-quarterback. I don't like those odds at all. I mean, I love B. John Robinson, but he, they're not going to the playoff and he's not going to have enough yards. I mean, he would have to run absolutely bonkers as a I mean, I don't even think I've seen when I went back to the SC, uh, to the to the historical numbers, a second year running back has not won at least since 1998. I did not go back further than that, but all the running backs were third year and then went to the NFL. Brees Hall comes in as the stud out of Iowa State. Again, love Brees Hall. I do think, I mean, he almost had 1,800 yards last season, so I think 2,000 total yards is in play. Uh, but he'd probably need like 2,000 yards and 25 to 30 touchdowns. Najee Harris, when he won it, had 30 touchdowns. Uh, the playoff feels highly unlikely. I keep saying Najee Harris. He did not win the Heisman. I'm talking about Derrick Henry is the running back that won the Heisman. I'm not going to go back and edit this whole thing, but if you made it this far, I am correcting myself. I'm very sorry. It was it was not Najee Harris who won the Heisman as a running back from Bama. It was Derrick Henry. He had over 2,000 yards. Um, I don't even remember his, uh, his touchdown total, but I'm sure it was ungodly. Let's just take a look because it's kind of interesting. So... He had 2300 total yards and 30 or and 28 touchdowns. 2300 yards and 28 total touchdowns. Um so I think you're you're going to have to be flirting with 25 plus touchdowns and and certainly at 2000 or over 2000 total yards. Um and when Derrick Henry did it, he was on the best team in the country in Bama. Um Iowa State probably not going to be considered that. The playoff feels highly unlikely for them. Uh, in my opinion, like I said, they are at, down at 40 to one odds to win the national title. I just don't think he plays for a high enough profile team to get in the Heisman conversation, especially as a running back, not a quarterback. I just I'm not sure I see that. So let's move down to a big long shot that I think is actually my favorite long shot out of the top teams where if you're being realistic, the quarterback for the top five or six teams is probably who you want to look at. The, the best non-QB to me to put uh, any kind of bet on is Isaiah Spiller. He's sitting at 50 to 1. At least when I looked at these odds, he was at 50 to 1. He's the running back for Texas A&M. And you do have to project a big jump. I mean, I think last year he had 1,200 total yards or so. Um, so you'd have to project a big jump in yards. I mean, I think he'd at least need 1,800 total yards. And again, 25 to, to 30 touchdowns. So he'd have to go bonkers. But the big thing here is the playoff potential. So for the Texas A&M schedule, Bama is really the only thing between them and an undefeated season and a playoff berth. If they win the West, beat whoever comes out of the East and go to the playoff. Uh, you can see it happening. I mean, they just have to beat Bama, basically. The rest of the West, I think, is a down um, in terms of like LSU and Auburn, Auburn's going to be bad. LSU is not the LSU of old. Um, I'm kind of think that Ed Orgeron lucked into the Joe Brady season, and I'm not sure we're going to see them be that good until they kind of overhaul the coaching staff. But in any case, 
I think they're lacking overall talent uh, at LSU at some key positions like quarterback for one. And um, I don't see them as a playoff team. So you've got Texas A&M battling it out with Bama. That is going to be the game of the West uh, is the Bama at Auburn or the Bama Alabama Texas A&M game this year. And uh, you can absolutely tell yourself a story that Texas A&M crashes the SEC and is kind of a dark horse and makes the playoff. Vegas agrees. They have them as the six best, best odds to make the playoff. Georgia uh, is eight to one. And there is a big jump to Texas A&M at 25 to one. And Isaiah Spiller is not a quarterback, but I will say, I think he's like the going to be the heart and soul of that team this year. So he's going to be the best player on a team that has a chance to crash a realistic chance to crash the playoff that with only real one game that they have to get by in the regular season. <clears throat> So, yeah, I mean, that that's a pretty fun one. And at 50 to 1, you're talking a major, major, major payout there. Um, so I think that's one worth considering. Um, you've, got a, you've got a chance at that one. Let's see. Then you've got some just ludicrous long shots. And what I did was say, okay, who's, you know, after Texas A&M, who are the next two teams in line with odds to win the national title? Wisconsin and LSU are tied for uh, 35 to one. So they're major long shots, but I think it's worth just looking. And uh, for, for Wisconsin, the quarterback is Graham Mertz and he's sitting at 150 to one. Now I do not endorse this bet. Uh, if you are putting anything on anything that's 150 to one, you can pretty much kiss that money goodbye and just check it at the end of the season and see what happens. Just assume you're going to lose it. But the story here is that Wisconsin basically has two games they need to win. Um, they have the seven best odds to make the playoff, even though there's a big jump from six bets in Georgia to, or uh, sorry, uh, fifth best in Georgia to the TAMU, uh, Wisconsin, LSU range. There's a big gap there, but they still are seventh best odds to make the playoff. They have Notre Dame at a neutral site, and I think a down year. They're also going to get be doing a new quarterback uh, in Notre Dame. Um, these two teams are going to play a gross game. I think Wisconsin could certainly beat that. It's a neutral site in Chicago. And then they don't face Ohio State until the Big Ten Championship, You know, assuming they make it there. So they don't have Ohio State in the regular season. Their big, big, big game is Notre Dame, who I think is not that good. I think Wisconsin is a very sneaky undefeated team this year. And so do I think their offense is going to put up enough odds and or stats and, and big numbers and everything for their quarterback to win? Probably not. That's why it's 150 to one. I mean, odds are so high. Of course they're high for a reason. Uh, but the story goes, Wisconsin crashes the playoff. They beat, Ohio State somehow in the Big Ten Championship. And Mertz has a darn good season for the Badgers. Um, there are people that think Mertz is a legitimate NFL prospect and can be one of the better quarterbacks uh, in the class that he declares in. So I, it's crazy, but there are crazier things. I would rather put $100 on Mertz than a hundred dollars on B. John Robinson. I'll tell you that much when you're talking about return on the on the potential bet and likelihood of this team, you know, making the playoff. Uh obviously it's a risk reward here, but the reward is so big, it's not it's I don't think that it it's terrible uh when you're talking super duper long shot because I'm looking for teams who are going to make the playoff. And I do not think there's any world where Texas makes the playoff. Then we've got Jalen Berger, who's their running back. He is 100 to 1. And so you're telling yourself the story that instead of Graham Mertz being the big offensive showcase, it's uh, Jalen Berger. And, you know, he flirts with 2,000 yards on a team that crashes the playoff. Boom. There you go. And then the final is uh, LSU quarterback. We don't even know who's going to be starting for them. I could not find odds on Max Johnson or Miles Brennan. Uh, if you could find odds, I'm sure they'd be very, very high. Uh, this feels like lightning can't strike twice in terms of an unknown LSU quarterback blowing up the system and winning the Heisman in one season. Um, but, 
you're picking quarterbacks on teams that could crash the playoff. I, I like I already said. I mean, I, I don't think LSU's that team. We definitely didn't think LSU was that team in 2019 or whatever it was. Um, so I, you know, it doesn't seem like that's really possible. But if you're looking for crazy odds, that's you know, out of the West in the SEC, I think that's who you're talking about. So we've covered. SEC West, we've covered the more likely teams out of the SEC East and their quarterback situation. Uh, Texas A&M quarterback, I couldn't even find it. We don't know who it's going to be, and I, I would, I just, I don't think either one of them is going to light the world on fire. I think if anything comes out of Texas A&M, it's going to be a, a beast running back season from Spiller. And just to go back up, you know, we're talking about these teams with with uh, 35 25 and 35 to 1 odds to win some teams like with Heisman contenders UNC Southern Cal Texas uh 50 to 1 i mean that's way worse than 25 to 1 uh and way way worse than 8 7 5 to 1 so those teams you know that's why Howell Matt Corral uh, Derek King, Bijan Robinson, Keaton Slovis. I mean, I just, I don't think the chances of them winning enough games and being high profile enough at the end of the season is there. And their odds aren't, aren't deep enough that it makes that risk worth it. <clears throat> so just to recap, I think there's been a fun discussion. Uh, it's more than just, do you want to bet on the Heisman? But it's also, what do these teams look like? What do these schedules look like? Can you envision one of these teams making the playoff? That also, you know, has implications. So I thought it was a fun discussion because of all the variables that you are looking to bake into uh, these players and why they are ranked the way they are in terms of their odds to win the Heisman. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. But just to recap, Spencer Rattler is the favorite five and a half to one. DJ, you, Bryce Young, CJ Stroud, all the next uh, three at six, eight, and ten to one. JT Daniels, 12 to 1. Howell, Corral, King, B. John Robbins, Slovis are all in the range of 12 to 20 to 1. Uh, and then Slovis, yeah, 25 to 1. Emery Jones, 33 to 1. Brees Hall, 40 to 1. Isaiah Spiller, 50 to 1. Mertz and Berger, like I said, extreme long shots, 150 to 1 and 100 to 1 for Berger. And Max Johnson, Miles Brennan could not even find them. I will say this. I was not impressed with Mac Johnson, but Miles Brennan was putting up some legit numbers uh, before he got injured. If he's the starter, that would be at least something to consider. But again, I they're not their their whole team context just I don't think is there to beat not only Bama, gonna have to beat Texas AM, gonna have to beat Florida. Um, it's just a, a it's just a tough road to imagine LSU running the table and, and getting enough. Uh, steam there to be a favorite uh, for the national title, which is necessary, I think, to be a Heisman contender. That's just the way it is. All right. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this. We're going to cut it off here. We will see you guys next time. Hopefully, I'm going to have a guest lined up, and we'll we'll just talk a little bit more. And then I cannot wait for the beginning of the season. We've got so many fun things ready for you. I'm going to be working with Chris Moxley here at the at campuscanton.com. And we're going to be giving you excellent uh, and hopefully entertaining and actionable DFS advice all season long. Uh, we've got some new shows planned. It's going to be it's going to be fantastic. So stick with us, and uh, we will uh, talk to you next time. Until then, why wait till Sunday?